it's amazing to have like a good support system around you and, and you, you definitely have that person. You just have to find who it is, whether it's your, your mom, your dad, your wife, your partner, whoever. I mean, we have a, like my wife is in, incredible and I mean, she supports what we do 100%. Um, sometimes she pushes me to buy something that I maybe I wouldn't have. And, uh, you know, I pretty much manage all the construction end of it myself. And, uh, but she, like, just having that person is incredible. Welcome to the Real Estate Riches Podcast, your source for real estate investment education. Each week, we'll feature an interview with a successful investor who will share their story to help us better understand the business of real estate investing. And now, here's your host, Gabe De Silva. Guys, welcome back to the Real Estate Riches Podcast. I'm here with my good friend, Gary Mawson, uh, real estate investor, agent, um, passive buy and hold investor. And so, Gary and I have known each other for a handful of years, and uh, I'm going to let him kind of tell you guys a little bit about where he's at in his journey now, kind of share his origin story with you. And then we're going to dig into um, all things passive. We're going to dig into uh, the quick nickel versus the slow dime, a dialogue he and I have often that we want to kind of have you guys look in on as we kind of unpack that. Uh, we'll talk about sourcing projects. We'll talk about um, comps and, and what projects are worth in this market upon resale. Uh, uh, and again, I'll preface our talk with uh, a timestamp. So at the time of this recording, we are in the midst of the COVID quarantine towards what we believe to be the tail end of that. Um, so if you're catching this now, it's very much relevant. Uh, if you're catching this later on, just be conscious of that. And that's where we are now. So um, let me kick it over to you, Gary. Tell uh, folks a little bit about yourself. Give them a little bit of your origin story. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Gabe. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, obviously, you know, my name, Gary Mawson. I have been in this business for about 16 years now. Uh, I'm originally from South Jersey, down outside of Atlantic City. I, I now reside in Neptune, New Jersey, right by Asbury Park, for those of you who don't know where Neptune is. And, um, you know, I started in this industry as a mortgage rep. I did that for about three and a half years, right out of college. And... I decided to switch over. I've been licensed since 2007. I've got my broker's license as well. I think I've had that for about five or six years now. And I am a, primarily I do real estate. It's my business. My wife and I do this together. We're both full-time agents in the business. And, you know, this year we'll sell probably somewhere in the $20 million range by the end of the year. And uh, we've been doing buy and hold. And we've been doing any type of real estate investments really strongly for the past five years. And, um, you know, we've gone on this journey, been able to meet a lot of uh, great people and make a lot of great contacts. Gabe and I have been talking, for, like you said, for the past few years. Uh, I, I met him on his at a level bus tour and uh, we just kept in contact from there. And, you know, getting other people's perspectives on different things is awesome. So, you know, I, Gabe talked to me about doing this because he knows I do a lot of more of the passive investing than the quick flips. So we're uh, here to chat about that. And I'm excited to get this, going, get this going. After the years that we've known each other, I still didn't realize how long you'd been in the space. I didn't know that it was a 16 year journey. And we've known each other for a few years. So even you sharing your origin story already, I'm learning a little bit more about you. And so herein lies why I wanted us to get together because of your wealth of knowledge, your experience with the mortgage piece, um, now being a broker, doing the volume you're doing, selling as an agent, plus then we got the investment side. And so let's jump into that because that's what I anticipated uh, our listeners, those coming on and watching and listening to this, wanting to kind of hear our perspectives on and so you and I kick this around a lot. So the concept of the quick nickel versus the slow dime, uh, getting paid now or getting paid later, transactional, um, like active versus passive. So I know you've, you've tried your hand at, at a whole host of different things in the investment arena. Um, so tell us a little bit about your experience with that. and why, When you look at something, what do you 
how do you decide if you're going to go for the quick nickel or the slow dime? Well, my primary method of, of investing just in general is the, the Burr strategy. Um, for those of you who don't know, that is buy, uh, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. I actually got that right. I'm surprised. <laughs> but uh, so I'm always looking at something that I can take and, and really do a value add to it and then rent it out on the back end. I really try to stay away from the, the flipping properties. Uh, we did recently just do one, but I just don't love it. it I just like the long-term hold. I feel like it's, uh, you know, I'm, as a real estate agent, I don't get a 401k or anything like that. So I'm really building for my future and making sure that I have something that I can retire on and something that I can fall back on, on even just a monthly basis. So I really look at the, the, the fix, the buy, fix, and holds. And I guess to answer your question, I look at a few different things is um, I primarily invest in single, like three bedroom, single family homes. And I, I like duplexes. Mm -hmm. I find that they're the, the easiest ones to, to basically manage. And, and really you have the, the three bedrooms you can easily turn over because they, they appreciate with the market and most people are looking for a three bedroom. I mean, the two bedrooms are great sometimes, but at the end of the day, a three bedroom is a more marketable property for me. Mm. So those are the kinds of things that I, that I always look at value add three bedroom or a uh, duplex. So, um, I mean, that's basically what I'm looking for. Mm. So your portfolio single fans, uh, they, like you said, three bed, two bath or, um, but they pass the litmus test for you. Um, you will buy, you'll burr a single fam. Yep. Mm. Okay. So that's good. That's good for us to get perspective on because that, that property class could easily be a flip for you. If you were going for the quick nickel, um, not that all flips are quick, but <laughs> if you wanted to, right. And you said you, you just recently flipped one and, uh, and you've done more than that in your, over the course of your journey, but that one, that one single fam, when you're looking at it, is it about like an awareness piece? Cause you talk to that, like, you know, that that's not where you want to be. Is it, uh, I need a pop of cash. So let me quickly lipstick this one or do a cosmetic rehab or whatever the case is. Does that play into where you are in the cycle? And then the decision is made based on that. Um, so usually whenever I'm looking at it, they could go either way. I mean, so I mean, you're really looking at anywhere from 20 to 25% in every property right from the start. So when I'm looking at those properties, uh, I, for me, I'm just, I'm like, all right, well, I can make, I, I usually have, I'm about four to $500 per door on a, on a rental. So I'm like, well, I can make four to $500 now. So you're looking at $4,800 for the year. I can refinance pretty much the majority of my money out of most of them. Uh, some of them I'm leaving a little bit of cash in it, but my cash on cash returns incredible on, on all of them. And we're really, you know, as the market appreciates, I'm starting this now that I've owned some of these properties for a few years, I'm really starting to see them appreciate and the, the values of them are going up tremendously. So now, I ha now instead of making that, that quick pop right in the beginning, I have a $4,800 on it for, per door. And that now the market's appreciating. So like, just for instance, like I own a three bedroom in, in Neptune. And um, I don't know, do you want me to get into the numbers on it? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's unpack one. That'd be cool. All right, cool. So I bought it for 140 and we put about $60,000 into it. So we're all in for 200 grand. And it was one of my first ones, so I, I went a little higher on it, but it's just one that I've been working on, so it's on top of my it's top of mind right now. We so we're in for to for 200 and I knew all day it would rent for at least $1900. Uh, we ended up getting 1950 out of that property which fits right into kind of where my criteria is, which is the quick formula that I always use is purchase price plus construction. My rental number should be about 1% of that number. So 1950 is going to be just shy of that $200,000 number for, for the 1% rule. 
-hmm. So on that, I'm getting about four, I think it's 420 something dollars right now a month is what my cash flow is on that property. So when I'm looking at it now, I know that I have, I, when I originally analyzed the property, I knew 250 was the value that I was looking at on the back end. And so at $250,000, I know off the top of my head from the mortgage days is that 70, I can refinance that on the back end on an investment property, cash out at 75%. So 75% of that 250 number is going to be $187,500. And I'm leaving a little bit of money in it, but at the end of the day, I'm in it $13,500. I have, you know, including that number, I have $62,000 in equity and I'm getting $400 a month in positive cash flow. Mm -hmm. So for $13,500, I'm getting $4,800 a month, which I didn't do the math beforehand, which is probably somewhere, what, 50% mm -hmm. cash on cash, maybe a little less. I mean, where else are you getting that return on your money? And, and you have a tangible asset now that's a pre, that all the capital expenditure is pretty much done because I renovated the whole property. So I have $62,000 in equity, I have $400 a month cash flow. I have um, a tangible asset that's going to appreciate. Mm -hmm. And I also have a tax write off at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. The project pays you multiple times. So the thing about the flip model is that it's, transactional in a sense that you chase the next closing. And so it only pays you once. The Burr strategy, Eric, Gary just outlined how he's getting paid multiple times over the course of time on that one project that would have otherwise been a quick nickel. He would have banked 50K, pay capital gains, get smoked. Uh, and instead, he's got an asset, it's appreciating, it's paying him um, monthly. Uh, tax write-off. There's a whole host of benefits to the model. Uh, the, what I alluded to before and something you had said about like the awareness thing. And so assuming you needed a pop of cash, you're open to doing the deal that way, open to the flip, um, whole tail or cosmetic, whatever it depends what it warrants, but if it can, you can get in and out of it quick and get a pop of cash to, cover overhead or whatever the case is, or to scale another division of your operation. Um, you're not closed off to the idea. It's just the primary focus is the burr and is the building of the portfolio. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. That's good. So I was just on with someone earlier today talking about how we can't be one trick ponies. And in this industry in particular, like we absolutely should not be because real estate serves you in so many different ways. There's so many ways to make money in the real estate space. And if you need pops of cash, you can hold sale, hold tail. You can, you can do rehabs in varying degrees of, um, uh, of intensity, right? It could be just a cosmetic rehab, a gut rehab. It could be an at a level or a new construction project and the spreads will get bigger or they should get bigger. The further up the ladder you go there, um, there's your pops of cash. You want to start building equity. You want to uh, go the passive route. Uh, you can do what Gary's doing with the building of the portfolio. Um, ultimately, you can transition up into uh, larger scale multifams and syndications. So I wasn't anticipating going there, but since I'm kind of talking our way up the ladder there, is that where you envision going next? You like the idea of building the portfolio with singles, twos, threes, fours. Uh, what, what, what would you say to that? <laughs> it's a good question. I, I do like the syndication and all that. I do need to learn a little bit more about how they're finding these properties and how, like how they're doing all of it. I mean, I understand the basic concepts of, you know, raising the money and finding the, finding the deals and all, all that. And I've had enough conversations around it where it really does make a lot of sense I just don't know that I personally have the time right now to really mm -hmm. dive deep into it. And I don't want to get too far away from my one thing right now mm -hmm. to, to jump into that. I may invest passively in something like that. If it's somebody that I really trusted that, that I knew was going to do a good job on it. I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm very busy with the, you know, the residential real estate ends and, you know, a lot of times, 
the properties that we're finding are because we're in that every day and we're making those phone calls. So uh, I, you know, I haven't had a, that call where somebody's like, I have a, a hundred unit building that I'm looking to sell. So I'm not, uh, you know, trying to tackle that one just right now. That's a good point. We talked on this offline when you and I last spoke about how you can still get visibility into a different sector of the real estate space without necessarily having to be um, a syndicator. You don't have to be the sponsor. You could be the LP who invests. We're passively invested in a 96 unit in Kentucky and we've never been there and we don't intend to go there anytime soon, but we're getting visibility into this syndication into how this large scale multifam investment world works. Uh, like you said, to go deep and um, to make that our one thing, you would have to in fact make it your one thing. So uh, I think kudos to you for realizing that and, and for not um, falling victim to shiny object syndrome, which I often do. <laughs> the, hard uh, not to. I know, and especially in this space because there's so many different sectors, right? And we're not even going to go down the self-storage path and, like, and, and notes and all those other things that you can do. Um, so let, let's focus. And, and so you, and you said something again about the retail piece and you introduced that when you first um, – told us a bit of your origin story. Tell us about what the retail piece is looking like now, because um, you're in that every day. Well, it's definitely one of the hottest seller's markets that I've ever been a part of. And uh, I started in this business as the, just before the market, the bubble actually uh, popped and then really like came crashing down. And, uh, you know, that's when I decided that it was a good time that I should be getting into this business, but definitely made me stronger. Uh, the retail part, I mean, it's incredible how much, how much value people are getting out of their properties right now. I feel like it's, they're starting to get a little bit greedy, mm. but at the same time, uh, when you're looking at those properties i mean if you're looking to down if you have somebody that's looking to downsize right now they're they're you know empty nester or like the baby boomer somebody's getting ready to retire even if they weren't really quite ready it might be a good time to really just sell their house now maybe rent for a year or two years or just sell now and buy something cheaper uh, you're still paying top dollar on both ends, but if you you know you sell hot, sell on your bigger property now and then you buy the lower property, you're still taking that spread out of there. So you're not really you you are making out a little bit better right now. Mm -hmm. well, so before we start a recording, uh, that's great advice for. And so again, to timestamp this at the time of this recording, we are in month five or six of uh, COVID quarantine, and so what started out as this like freeze in the market early on in say March, April has unwound into this insane um, lack of supply driven bidding war fest. There is just nothing to be had out there. Anything that's even relatively new, anything uh, within proximity where we are in New Jersey, anything within proximity to the trains to Manhattan, people assuming at some point they may be going back to work there. Are, um, are, are picking things up, are overbidding things uh, like mad. And like Gary said, people are taking advantage uh, and listing and, and, and a lot that were waiting to uh, downsize, retire, whatever the case is and go out of state. Uh, this is probably what's prompting that. <laughs> Let's go to Florida now. Like we'll never get as much for our house as we'll get right now. And so we're seeing things um, go. We'll see, we'll see things list and go within a couple of days. Uh, so it's great for us to have product to be bringing to market. Frankly, I wish we had more. Um, but who would have guessed that this is where we'd be uh, five-ish months, six months, whatever we're into quarantine. Um, so let's talk in that, in keeping with that theme, what we were talking about before we started recording with regard to comps and what's happening. And so this is going to go, um, and for those that are active in this space, this will absolutely serve you. So, uh, this isn't us going into the weeds for no reason, because this matters. And, uh, like I said, that's why I timestamp this interview as many times as I have. So what's happening with these comps now, what are we seeing happen with what people are getting out of their properties? Well, 
when you're going in to comp a property out when you're purchasing it, it you're you really have to look at everything like before it was just really like okay what are the what are the sold comps and what's my competition and kind kind of gauging it on that but the market really hasn't caught up to the sold comps yet or the sold mm-hmm. comps haven't caught up to the market yet we're still in that cycle where they're they're going to start closing out when you're actually looking at all your comps, you have to go into what's under contract right now. And Mm -hmm. that's just as important as your, if not more important than your closed comps right now. Mm -hmm. And so look, according to national association of realtors, we know homes typically sell within 3% of asking price whenever they go under contract. So when we're looking at that and, and right now, I mean, you're pretty much at a hundred or a hundred plus if they're going under contract within the first week of the week of the property going on the market. Mm. When you're looking at a specific area, if there's a, if there's a, like a laundry list of homes that are all under contract and, and they're at a, you're looking at those prices because those prices are actually higher than what the closed comps have been in the last 90 days. I mean, that really being said, I mean, you're, you have to really analyze everything. Look at the, un, the, the active homes are your competition, which they're very slim. You're really, there's not a whole lot of competition out there because things are flying off the market. Mm. And if you're on the market for really, honestly, two weeks, <laughs> typically it's price. You're overpriced at that point. And in this market, if you're on the market for 14 days and it's still sitting there and you don't have an, uh, like an offer and a turn your review or... Mm-hmm you know, actively negotiating an offer, you're, you're out of the market. You need to lower your price and get back, get, come back down to reality and just be there. Oh man, and this is gold, gold. <laughs> so, so nuanced, but so critical. I'm so glad we're, we're digging in. Um, and so a lot of the viewers, people that are tuning in, listening and watching are going to be investors in some capacity and they're going to be looking at things now if they're catching this and, and this is going to be very relevant and, and of great value to them. Um, and then w- even if they're catching this later, still like immensely valuable, tell them about going in um, comps, going in as an investor, looking at what you're ultimately going to bring to market uh, if say it's a flip. So how do they do this responsibly? Even with what's going on right now, what, what would you advise? Be ultra conservative. Go on worst case numbers. I'm I'm really I, I hate I hate it sometimes because I'm all, like almost too conservative when I'm looking at the numbers. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, not I have you know I have my uh, horror stories too. I'm sure you do. I mean, mm-hmm. I I lost money on on a prop on properties and back in. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. Lo- look at the lead, the, the cheapest comp that really goes in that area, like comp it out and get, get your number where you think it is. And if it fits in within like that low price, the lower end of the, of your comp comp things, and you're still going to make a decent amount of money or whatever your target, your target number is, then, then go from that. And the same thing with when you're looking at your construction piece, it's like how many times you go over Mm-hmm. Probably a hundred percent of the time yeah. you're over, over whatever your budget was. So it's like, you always want to like be ultra conservative on your, on your construction and on, and on your um, comps on the end, because there's only really one place that you can make, make extra money is, is when you're purchasing the property. So mm-hmm. if you're not ultra conservative on your numbers and know your numbers like down to, down to a T and then, you know, you're going to, you could overpay for a property and then it's just going to hurt your margins on the back end. Mm, yeah. Money is uh, made when the property is purchased, the profit is realized when it is sold, the, the work is done on the front end to make sure that your uh, CYA, uh, I, I love that you said like, Hey, we're ultra conservative on the front end uh, because we know better because we've been burned because we've modeled things aggressively only to come and find out later that the market won't bear what we thought it would, despite having managed construction, you know, well or poorly, it doesn't necessarily matter. It's like the time comes to sell this thing. And we said we were going to get 650 and then the market saying, no, you're not, you're going to get 620. And so, um, and if you're using hard money, which uh, you guys have heard me speak on before, hard money lenders or community bank financing, if they're going to come in and loan to you on your project, they're going to bring in a third party uh, appraisal partner 
who's going to beat you up anyway. So they almost force you to be conservative when you would otherwise want to be aggressive. Um, but it's important that you understand why, why we do this, why folks like Gary are going to tell you to be wise to that and to not get ahead of yourself. And if you're going to make the money, you want to make the money, make it on the front end. They go and renegotiate with the seller. If uh, that's not common practice, it's not something we advocate for, but if you're under contract at the time of this recording, if you're watching this now and something's under contract and you're like, wait, like, I was a little aggressive on the buy side here. Um, there's nothing wrong with going back to them and saying, hey, I reran my numbers and uh, I'm not banking on appreciation. I'm not banking on what's happening right now in the market. Uh, I'm going to bank on a conservative figure. So uh, that was powerful too, man. So glad we're, we dug into that a little bit more. Uh, so let's just, um, let's leave folks with a parting piece of guidance um, for the investor, whether it's the um, active fix and flip investor or the passive, the build the portfolio, the Burr model. I'll let you choose who you want to kind of throw one parting piece of guidance to and then uh, we'll hit you with our final question beyond that. But what, what do you think is a good, a good approach for them to take now and even in the future? Uh, you know, the hardest thing is really just getting started. So if you find something that you really like is to kind of just, you know, trust in what you believe and trust in yourself and really it's amazing to have like a good support system around you. And, and you, you definitely have that person. You just have to find who it is, whether it's your, your mom, your dad, your wife, your partner, whoever. I mean, we have a, like my wife is in, incredible. And I mean, she supports what we do a hundred percent. Sometimes she pushes me to buy something that I, maybe I wouldn't have. And uh, you know, I pretty much manage all the construction end of it myself. And, uh, but she, like, just having that person's incredible. Really, I, I'm, like I said, I'm a buy and hold investor and just finding the deal that makes sense and going with it. As the buy and hold, you, you really, you can make a little bit more mistakes on the money end because as long as the cash flow is there, your margin just might be a little bit less on the, on per, per month. But at the end of the day, you're, you're still going to make money and, appreciation over time is going to save your ass because mm -hmm. you know 10, 10 years down the line when that property is appreciated and your and inflation's gone up your rents are going to increase so now your margins start to get bigger and bigger from what you're paying on a monthly basis to what you're bringing in on the property mm -hmm. the uh, you know again like i i have a two family and i, I call it my son's college funds mm -hmm. so my son's gonna is four years old i bought it when he was one and we it was a it was a shit show when i bought it i mean the, i had tenants in there when i purchased the property i bought it as a short sale and it cash flowed day one at, and i bought it with hard money 12 percent interest and i held that note for a year because i couldn't get traditional financing but it cash flowed 600 bucks every month and you know we struggled <laughs> struggled through paying uh, all those bills and did whatever we had to do and now we're we we refinanced that one finally and we basically started getting this tremendous cash flow on this on this two family home mm -hmm. and as these tenants have moved out now we've renovated those units so uh, the property uh, i mean we bought it for 189.9 in 2017 so we've owned it for a few years now and these tenants are basically paying down my, my, my property. I've mm -hmm. even taken cash out of it. So I refinanced that to $225,000 about a year ago. And I, you know, now it's down, it's down again. So like there I'm creating equity in that property again by the, the debt pay down on a monthly basis. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've in about, 14 years when my son's ready to go to college or even if he doesn't want to go to college, I, I'm not really for either way, but yeah. I, I should have over, over $200,000 in equity in this property. I can simply just refinance it back to the point where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. And now I have a chunk of cash that's tax free that I'm not paying on that I can now use to pay for college or mm -hmm. whatever, start a business, buy another property. And really now, now I'm just snowballing it and we're trying to buy more of these properties like that. 
and we're, we have cash flow real estate, we have cash flow coming in from the property that we essentially use as like capital expenditure for other things. But it's really, it, it's powerful when you start compounding that and you have mm -hmm. more, than, more than one and then you have two and then you have three, four and five and now your cash flow becomes, becomes bigger and bigger. And really that's kind of the, mm -hmm. the track that I've been going down. And the reason why I don't <laughs> really like the flipping is I'm looking for that my, uh, my passive income to exceed what my expensive are, expenses are for the financial freedom piece. Mm -hmm. And... I don't know. That's Does that powerful. answer the question? Yeah. Two monster takeaways, like uh, right out of the gate, 95% of success is who you choose to marry. That's a Buffett quote. And so you gave uh, your wife some love as you began to answer the question. So kudos to you for that. Never and then, even heard that quote. <laughs> so true though. It's, uh, so that's powerful. And then beyond that, the, the tipping of the first small domino and you brought it full circle when you said the compound effect, uh, people don't understand the concept of the power of compounding. And so, like you said, you tip the first small domino and then the deal flow. And then ultimately what was, um, supplemental income can become your main source of income. Like you could be netting 25, 50, hundred K a month at some point in the future from your passive investments. Uh, but it just takes getting started and tipping that first small domino. And then as it goes, if you guys are watching, you're, I'm doing this with my hand to show you how it works. And then that big one falls. So thank you for that. That absolutely answered the question. Now, let me ask you two things. First, tell these guys where they can find you online. Where do you want them to go to connect with you? And then hit us with, with your journey having been as long as it's been and you've touched in different sectors um, of the real estate investment space and, and the retail piece and everything else that you've done. What did you believe about real estate when you got started or soon after you got started that you no longer believe now? So where can they find you and then kind of bring it home with, uh, with that last parting piece of guidance for, for everybody? <laughs> um, well, you can email me anytime. It's just my name, gary.mawson at gmail, or you can find me on, in, on Instagram. I'm at investor data. So, um, yeah, those are probably the two places you can find me. I'm not really that as active on Facebook as I probably should be, but there you go. Mm -hmm. Um, so what was the second part? What, uh, what do I believe about real estate that I no longer believe or what did yeah, I believe so what, about it? What did you early on in your journey, since your journey has been, um, it's been a 10 year, right? And so you've done a lot of different things. So it's great to get the perspective of someone who's been in and out of different sectors of the real estate space to get a perspective on what did you believe? What were you so certain was the case then that you now look back on and say, wait a second, like I no longer believe that. In fact, I know that not to be true. Uh, you know, getting started on investing always seemed impossible in the beginning. And, you know, probably my first deal kind of fell on my lap and we just figured out a way to do it. We had no idea how we were going to purchase it. We were like, well, well how are we going to do this? Where are we going to get the money? And, you know, you just start with one phone call and then you make another yeah. and another. We tapped out our 401k. We cashed mm -hmm. that out completely. I mean, that's gone. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, getting started and finding money finding money always seemed like this big insurmountable task. And mm -hmm. the further I get into this, it, it's, it's the complete opposite. Money is, if you have a great deal, somebody's going to be willing to invest with you. Mm -hmm. And I hear it on podcasts and other things over and over again. And it, it's like, it's so true mm -hmm. yeah, that if you have the deals, the money, money comes my first deal was 14% and five points. <laughs> I'm pretty sure when I, when I came out of it, the investor almost made as much money as I did on that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, that was the only way I could get it done. I called everybody that hmm. I needed to call in order to get that, that deal done. And finally somebody was willing to take a gamble on me and hmm. we successfully did it. We snowballed that into, into other properties I mean, I talk about the birth strategy, but we've done a number of other different things as well. I mean, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Right. It's not about lack of resources. It's about lack of resourcefulness. And a lot of people watching this, that'll serve them because they are fearful of whether or not if they lock up the deal, they'll be able to find the financing. Um, most expensive financing is the financing you do not source for the deal you do not do. So if you have access to monies at five and 14, uh, if that's what it takes to get you going to tip that first small domino, do it. So long as the numbers make sense and you're going to make money, <laughs> do it, take action. Uh, powerful, man. That was great. I, I think, um, I want to be conscious of your time, be respectful of your time. Uh, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for imparting so much wisdom on us. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey with us. And uh, it was an honor to have you on, man. When, when are you buying yours? Your next one, huh? That's right. That's what accountability is all about, to have the right partner in your circle to force you out of your comfort zone. <laughs> you got to get rid of some of those gains over there, buddy. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time. And I enjoyed doing it. And, uh, you know, whenever, whenever we're ready to do it again, I'm, I'm game. Real estate investment rock stars. Congratulations on taking one more step toward real estate riches. I know that you're serious about a successful future in the real estate investment business and the real estate riches podcast is going to help you get there. Head on over to GabeDaSilva.com right now and get yourself signed up for a coaching call where Gabe will help you figure out the next step on your journey. Thanks again for listening and we'll catch you on the next episode of the real estate riches podcast.